Uh, so hi everyone and uh, thanks for joining again. Uh, today's a great pleasure to introduce uh, one of our own, uh, Dr. Carolina Casadillo. So a uh, few things about uh, Carolina. So Carolina obtained her master's degree in uh, cosmology at the University of Bologna in 2010 in Italy. Uh, then she moved to another nice place, Granada, for um, her uh, PhD. Uh, then she graduated in 2016 and then moved to another very nice city in Bonn, where we actually met at the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy. And she was there until 2019. And then at which point she, she uh, came to the ultimate nice place, which is Crete. And she's been here ever since. Um, uh, very recently, she won a very prestigious uh, ERC starting grant. And today she's going to talk about uh, this project and uh, which is called SMILE. So Carolina, thanks again for doing this and um, the floor is yours. Thanks, thanks John, do you? Can you hear me well? Very well, yeah. Okay, very well. So, yes, so hi everyone. Thanks for having me here today. Um, so I'm, I'm really happy actually to giving this uh, talk now at this time because I can finally advertise the uh, recent success with the, uh, with the European funding for this project. So I don't only have to, to start this uh, talk as I was used to start saying that is a recent project that we start with some collaborator that by the way are listed here. There are also many more that uh, have participated on a, a pilot to a study for this project. Uh, but now I can also say that this uh, uh, project has uh, also many years uh, in front of it to, to, to hopefully carry good uh, science. So the, the name of the project is MILE, as you see here, uh, the, um, that stays for search for mini lenses, uh, because in this project we use a gravitational lensing on the key but poorly explored milliard second scales um, to search for supermassive compact objects, as uh, for example, dark matter subgraphic halos, and then to ultimately discriminate between dark matter models, as I will show you now. So uh, let's start saying that uh, we know very few about our universe. And if we know something is that it's uh, uh, mostly made of, uh, of of unknown that the roughly the 95% uh, uh, of the total energy content of the universe is made of uh, unknown forms of uh, energy and matter. And that the, um, in the standard cosmological model, this matter is in the form of uh, cold dark matter particles, therefore the lambda CM models, where particles are non relativistic at their origin and they are collisionless. This matter makes uh, up roughly the 84% of the total matter in the universe. But uh, because of the elusive detection of this particle on one side, and because of the inability of the lambda scale model in explaining the uh, formation of uh, all possible scale structure in the universe on the other side, then there are still uh, many viable dark matter models on the table of discussion nowadays. And some of them have been actually uh, uh, created just to solve this uh, uh, lambda CM uh, paradigm issues. Um, the, here I listed some of them, the, uh, probably the most uh, uh, famous one, the one, the one most cited in literature, like for example, the self-interacting uh, dark matter model where cold dark matter particles scatter elastically between each other. Then we have a, a cold dark matter model with ultralight uh, particles, and this is the fuzzy cold dark matter model. And then we also have the uh, well-known warm dark matter model where particles are semi-relativistic at their origin. But dark matter doesn't have necessarily to be a particle. There are in fact also non-particle candidates, as for example, primordial black holes. And, uh, um, the range of possible masses for this object is, uh, is uh, wide, as you see here, because it's, uh, uh, it is connected to the different possible uh, formation time for this object after the Big Bang. Uh, there was also a, 
uh, recent renewed interest in this object after the uh, detection of the gravitational wave signal 1905-21 that was associated with the merging of uh, uh, two massive black holes, one of them with a mass of roughly 85 solar masses, uh, that raised a doubt on uh, its stellar origin. So as I, as I just said, the, um, the lambda CDM model is uh, quite successful in uh, uh, explaining the formation of the largest space structures in our universe, but it still has uh, some uh, difficulties, uh, mostly at uh, galactic and subgalactic scales. And for example, at subgalactic scales, uh, it predicts a number of the dark matter halos that is uh, far above the observed number. Moreover, the uh, density profiles of these dark matter subgalactic halos uh, uh, seem to be different from the predicted ones. And this is exactly what you have in this plot here, uh, where you have a, a density profiles of uh, a large number of dwarf galaxies uh, from this uh, in uh, green, the, the green point, uh, from, these, uh, uh, from the Little Things uh, uh, survey uh, published in OETAL 2015. And uh, uh, as you can see in this plot, uh, these uh, uh, green point, these uh, dwarf galaxies uh, um, are rising more slowly uh, toward the innermost region uh, than the gray uh, curves that instead represent the whole dark matter Navarro Franken White density profiles uh, uh, prediction that uh, instead predict the formation of a, a very high density. Uh, cusp at the center, while instead of these dwarf galaxies uh, seems, uh, seem to point more, um, more to, a, to the formation of a core-like center. And, and because of this, uh, this uh, problem is uh, uh, most of the time addressed as the core cusp uh, uh, problem. Uh, the, in any case, the, um, it's exactly at this subgalactic case uh, where different dark matter models uh, make very different predictions on the expected number of dark matter halos uh, as well as uh, uh, on their density profiles. And what you have, for example, in this pot, plot is the power spectrum of baryonic acoustic oscillations for different scales and different masses on top. And the gray shade area is uh, highlighting exactly these uh, subgalactic scales. The blue cores instead uh, um, are for different dark matter models. And if we focus, for example, on the uh, solid line, uh, that is the cold dark matter model, uh, and in the dashed line, that is uh, the warm dark matter model, we see that the warm dark matter model has a cutoff around the 10 to the 8 solar masses. And this means that uh, if the warm dark matter model is uh, the correct one, then we shouldn't see a uh, structure uh, below these uh, roughly 10 to the 8 solar masses in the universe. So these, uh, I hope I convince you that estimating the number of dark matter subgalactic halos is extremely important because it can help us in discerning the nature of dark matter. And so if, if this is so important, why this hasn't been this number hasn't been constrained before? Well, mostly because uh, these uh, dark matter subgalactic halos uh, are very hard, very hard to uh, to be detected. Um, here on the right, you have a, a beautiful image showing you um, uh, dwarf galaxies uh, spanning six order of magnitudes in uh, stellar masses from the more, most massive one and brightest one at the top left to the less massive and the faintest one at the bottom right. And, uh, and these last one are only detectable in a volume uh, around the Milky Way. And you can already see from this picture how difficult it is to, to observe, so to, through uh, optical frequencies to detect this, uh, this dark matter uh, halos at subgalactic scales. And this because uh, uh, being uh, small and uh, uh, being more dark matter dominated, they are extremely faint. Moreover, this applies uh, to uh, those dark matter halos uh, that uh, are massive enough in order to form galaxies. Because 
below some intent to the eight solar masses, we don't even expect them to form galaxies. Therefore, they are dark. And at this point, if for this object, the only, uh, the only way we have to, to detect them then is uh, through the gravitational effect that they exert on ordinary matter, therefore using gravitational lensing. But uh, for a dark matter halo, uh, in order to make a strong lensing on a background source, uh, it needs to have a certain density. Uh, a density that is above a certain threshold. And we can, to some extent, uh, parameterize this density using this uh, parameter here, the concentration parameter that is uh, the C you have here in the y-axis, uh, that tells us uh, how uh, concentrated toward the center is the mass in a, in a dark matter halo. And uh, uh, in this paper of a Wang and collaborator uh, in 2020, they, uh, they have been uh, investigating in detail the, uh, this concentration uh, for a, a, a sample of, uh, of simulated dark matter halo uh, for different masses versus their masses. And this is exactly what you have in, the, in this plot. So then the, the result, what they obtain is that, as you can see here, the, um, the uh, concentration of uh, uh, dark matter halos at subgalactic scales so that are the scales uh, uh, delimited by this orange line uh, is far above the, for example, the concentration instead of galaxy cluster dark matter halos. And since we know that galaxy cluster as well as galaxies, for example, uh, are dense enough uh, in order to make strong lensing on background sources, then this means that uh, uh, at least the course of these dark matter halos at subgalactic this case uh, should be able to make strong lensing on background sources as well. And so being so um, uh, highly concentrated and, uh, and having small masses, then we can approximate these uh, dark matter subgalactic halos uh, with a point mass uh, lenses, and in the with the gravitational in the gravitational lensing theory, we know that the point mass lens uh, split the image of the source in the background into two lens images, whose angular separation, if the source and the lens are at cosmological distances, and for order of magnitude precision it should depend only on the mass of the lens. Therefore, is the, if the lens is a compact object with a mass between 10 to the 6 and 10 to the 9 solar masses, I will call from now on this object a supermassive compact object, then we expect the, uh, the lens images of separation being in the milliard second regime. And for, for this reason, we call this gravitational lens system milli lenses. Um, so then the, uh, the direct observable of, uh, of milli lensing are supermassive compact objects uh, which have a surface mass density above a certain threshold that is the one that is, uh, uh, is shown here as I anticipated before. And uh, um, astrophysical objects that uh, satisfy this uh, condition are, for example, as I just mentioned, the, the course of subgalactic dark matter halos that we can find in the surrounding of galactic halos or even free floating in the field. But there are also other objects, other astrophysical objects that can satisfy this condition. And these are, for example, the supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies, as for example, the one that we find in active galaxies, um, or even primordial black holes that as I mentioned before, they are considered by some model a major component of the dark matter. The, um, the search for, um, for these uh, dark matter halos at subgalactic scale uh, until now has been mostly addressed uh, using uh, what I will call uh, indirect observational method. And I will explain you later why I call them like this. So uh, one of them is uh, uh, still make, makes use of uh, uh, gravitational lensing, but this time on galactic scales. So it means that in this case, uh, the lens is a galaxy with its own uh, dark matter halo. 
And uh, in this case, you can usually have uh, uh, two different scenario, like the one you can see here uh, at the right, the top right. So you you can be in a scenario A where uh, A where the uh, background source is an extended source, as for example another galaxy or uh, for example a radio loud quasar where we can resolve the jet. And then in this case, uh, you have usually the formation of uh, arc-like structure. And uh, in uh, some more fortuit case, you can even have the information of, uh, uh, of an entire Einstein ring. Then you can, you can be instead in, uh, in case B, uh, where the source in the background is a compact source, uh, as for example, a quasar observed at optical frequencies or a radio compact quasar. And then in this case, uh, you have instead the formation of multiple compact components as exactly we expect in case of milli lensing. But in this case, the angular separation between the, uh, the lens images is, uh, uh, is larger because the lens here is not a compact, a supermassive compact object, but is a galaxy. Uh, so we are usually talking about uh, angular separations of the order of, uh, of the arc second or some arc seconds. And uh, um, since in gravitational lensing, the um, the, the position and the magnifications of the lens images uh, are um, related to the uh, lens mass distribution, then this uh, uh, means that any anomaly in, in these uh, physical quantities uh, may tell us uh, about the presence of an extra mass contributing to, to the gravitational potential of the lens. And this extra mass should be usually should be located in the surrounding of the of the galaxy. And these are the uh, this is the method uh, used in these uh, in these two, uh, two two different scenarios here. Then we have another method that uh, makes use of uh, density perturbation uh, with the encounter basically of a, of a mass condensate. Um, and uh, this uh, density perturbation on a Milky Way stellar stream, um, so where the stellar stream is basically made of uh, escaping stars from, uh, uh, from disrupting globular cluster. Um, in this case, it is, uh, is, uh, is very difficult to, um, to understand if the density perturbation is something intrinsic to the stellar stream or if it's associated with a gravitational lensing event due to a mass aggregation in, in between the, the stellar stream and, and us. Then we have uh, another method uh, that still uh, makes use of the uh, gravitational lensing effect, but this time in the time domain. Uh, using lens gamma ray burst. Uh, with this method, in principle, it's possible to reach uh, up to, uh, to, to lower masses, uh, to uh, roughly 10 to the two solar masses. Um, and uh, there was a, a recent uh, study by a very recent collaborator 2021, where they used uh, the two uh, emission, the two burst, uh, the two episodes from this gamma ray burst, 210812A, uh, uh, using the air time, the time delay and the flux ratio between the two episodes, they were able to infer then the mass of the lens uh, doing this uh, uh, contributing here. Um, these, uh, uh, so as I said before, I call this uh, uh, indirect observational method because uh, the, um, it's, uh, uh, it's very difficult in all of these cases here to, uh, to understand if what we see is associated to, to something intrinsic or is instead uh, associated or is instead given by a gravitational lensing event. So if you, want, if you need, if you want to have a more direct proof of uh, the existence of a mass condensate like a supermassive compact object, uh, then you need to, uh, to have the image of the, of the lens images created by these uh, uh, supermassive compact objects. And since I showed you before that the lens images are uh, in, uh, in the, the angular separation between them is uh, in the milliard second regime, then we need the milliard second resol resolution. And the, the most direct way in order to reach this high resolution nowadays is using the very long baseline interferometry technique. In, uh, in this technique, um, 
antennas uh, observe all together, so in conjunction, uh, antennas located in different places, places around the world observe in conjunction, um, effectively using the entire Earth's surface as if it was one unique antenna. And uh, um, the, what I show you here are the two main uh, VLBI array, uh, arrays in the northern hemisphere that are the, uh, I show you this one because they are the one that I'm interested in. Uh, the, these two are the uh, European VLBI network with uh, antennas located in uh, Europe, Asia, and the one in South Africa. Um, and then we have the VLBA with antennas mostly located in uh, North America. So we, uh, we have performed a, a pilot search for, for this uh, object, for these uh, milli lenses. Uh, we have used the, the uh, publicly available data in the AstroGeo VLBI FITS image database. Uh, this database uh, uh, contains data mostly coming from uh, astrometry programs devoted to the completion of a radio fundamental catalog. So this means that the, uh, most of the sources there are uh, compact radio loud sources uh, observed at multiple frequency and uh, at multiple epochs. So at the time we performed this, uh, this search, we uh, collected data for almost 14,000 sources. Um, then we performed a stacking of, uh, of images for those sources where multiple ep epochs were available. And then we finally create, uh, based on the idea of the uh, citizen science project, we finally create a web page uh, for the visualization of uh, all the images. So it means uh, uh, multi-frequency images for each one of these uh, almost 14,000 sources. And then we have involved uh, five PhD scientists and nine undergraduate physics students from the University of Crete in the search. And uh, we have asked them to uh, possibly mark as a, um, as a uh, possible milli lens candidates, uh, sources that were displaying a multiple compact component uh, in at least one observing uh, uh, band, and the instead to mark as non lens uh, sources that, that were, were clearly showing uh, a core jet like uh, uh, structure, like the one on the, on the right. We also have inserted uh, 200 mock lenses in the, in the sample uh, uh, to check. Uh, as a sort of, uh, of, of quality check because the people who were involved, that were involved in the search were not expert in, uh, in gravitational lensing nor in the AGN physics. Uh, we have created these uh, uh, mock lenses, uh, basically faking the emission of, the, of a secondary component uh, and, uh, a put and inserting it in, the, in, uh, in any place uh, uh, within the field of view of, uh, of the source, as you see here at the bottom. Um, and uh, after this uh, first step of uh, visual inspection, we found that uh, eight of them were missing, uh, but fortunately six of them were missed by, uh, by two people, two persons in particular. So then we inspected the, all the sources inspected by these two persons that were roughly a thousand. And in this way, we were able to, uh, to assess a final loss rate around uh, 1%. And in this way, we were also uh, we also found the four more lens candidates. Uh, then we perform uh, two more step of these uh, uh, visual inspections. Uh, this time involving uh, uh, experts in uh, either gravitational lensing or uh, or AGN physics. And uh, at the at the end of these uh, uh, final. Uh, visual uh, steps, uh, we, we ended up uh, with uh, 59 uh, uh, millilens candidates. Then uh, as a last step, uh, we filter sources uh, based on the surface brightness preservation criterion. Um, we know that in, in gravitational lensing, uh, gravitational lensing is an achromatic uh, effect uh, that uh, should preserve some free physical quantities. And, and one of them is the surface brightness of, uh, the, of the lensed images. Uh, this means that uh, a secondary uh, weaker component should be smaller than the primary uh, brighter component. 
So then we used an apparent sur surface brightness ratio uh, lower than seven between the putative lensed images to then finally obtain uh, the list of the 40 most uh, probable millilens candidates. And then we published this list in, uh, in a recent uh, um, publication that you have here. Um, so there you can find the, the list that you also have here of the 40 millilens candidate. Here you have an example of, uh, of the type of images that you have in the AstroGeo catalog. You can find the, the images of all these sources in the AstroGeo uh, database. Um, the, just as a reminder, so all these 40 sources have multiple compact components, as you can see from these images, in at least one observing band, and they have an upper and surface brightness ratio between components lower, lower than seven. Then we also used the um, spectral index information to suggest the two most possible um, millilens candidates based on the fact that the, uh, the putative lens images have uh, similar flat uh, spectral indexes. And why this is important? Uh, so the fact that they, they have a similar spectral, uh, spectral indexes is important because, I as I just mentioned, the uh, gravitational lensing is expected to uh, preserve some physical quantities. Which are the surface uh, between the lensed images, so which are the surface brightness, the flux density ratio at the same frequency within epochs, and flux density ratio um, between the frequencies that translate into the spectral index. Um, moreover, the uh, the two light rays uh, forming the the two lensed images. Uh, have different paths. And these introduce uh, a time delay between the two lensed images. But since this time delay is, uh, um, is proportional to the uh, angular separation between the lensed images, and in, in millilensing, we have uh, angular separations that are very small. They are of the order of the milliarc second. Then this means that the uh, time delays in, in millilensing are very short and we can basically forget about them. They are of the order of, uh, they are less than a day, uh, some tens of second or, or hours, but in any case, less than a day. And this is important because uh, uh, it means that uh, the flux density ratio or spectral index measurements uh, are not affected by time delay. However, for the uh, spectral index measurements, uh, we cannot discard uh, the possibility that, that the uh, the, the, the two paths crossed by the two light rays have a different absorption, absorption coefficients, and, uh, and these lead to then a different spectral index for the two uh, lensed images. And, and because of that, we just use the spectral index information as a suggestion, but not as a constraint. Then the fact also that they are flat is important. Uh, so here you have a, a very famous gravitational lens system, uh, but on galactic scales. So here the lens is uh, this galaxy G1 plus another dwarf galaxy G2 uh, nearby. Uh, that they, they split the image of a, a radio loud compact quasar in the background into these four images, A, B, C, and D. And since the, um, the, the bulk of the mission in, uh, in radio loud compact quasar, we know that it comes from the core region, and we know that the core region has a, a flat spectrum, then we expect basically these uh, uh, four lens uh, images not only to have a similar uh, spectral indexes, but also to be flat, as it is exactly the case in this, uh, uh, in this gravitational lens system. Uh, and this is important because, for example, this can help us uh, also in, uh, in distinguishing uh, the uh, millilens candidate uh, from other type of uh, objects that may have a similar morphology to what we expect in case of, uh, of millilensing. Uh, but instead, they are other type of object, like, for example, in this case, you have uh, a core uh, feature plus another secondary feature along the jet. But in this case, uh, you don't expect either to have a similar flat spe um, uh, spectral index between the two components and nor to be both flat because usually the uh, spectral indexes of secondary component along the jet are steeper than the one of the, of the core. 
um, in uh, in general, the the steps in any case that we have to to perform in order to confirm the uh, Emilian system uh, that that we have been doing for this uh, uh, pilot study and that we will do also for the more extended uh, uh, projects are the the following one. So the the we. Uh, we have to visually inspect the uh, the VLBI images in search for uh, sources with uh, multiple compact components and familiar second scales. Um, then uh, those sources that pass this test, uh, they also have to pass the surface brightness preservation criterion, as I explained you before. And then for those sources that also pass this test, uh, we, we will proceed to analyze uh, flux density uh, ratios uh, at the same frequency uh, within epoch or spectral index uh, measurement. Uh, these ones we have obviously more information in our hand and, and so in order to collect this information, we have uh, um, applied and we obtain uh, time with the, with the EVN uh, to follow up our sources at uh, 5 and 22 gigahertz. And then basically once we obtain the, the images, the new images, we, we will perform the same type of, uh, of, uh, of search, the same type of loop. Uh, once uh, we will have done uh, uh, all these uh, analysis our hand, so the four sources that finally pass also the, um, the flux ratio and spectral indexes uh, uh, test, then we will finally test them against uh, uh, a lens model uh, in order to see if the, the position and the, and the uh, flux ratios of the putative lens images uh, can fit with a lens model. In any case, uh, all sources that will be discarded as a milli lens candidates, they can still be investigated as a, a compact symmetric object or even a supermassive binary black holes candidate. Um, compact symmetric objects or, or CSO are uh, considered the young uh, counterpart of the nowadays extended radio galaxies. In this object, the, the bulk of the emission comes from the, uh, from the lobe, uh, that is where the uh, terminating part of their jet is interacting with the, the interstellar medium in this case. And the, uh, the central engine or the core that is expected to uh, to, to be located in between these uh, two lobes uh, is most of the time obscured by, by the material. Uh, and uh, yes, and, and, and this uh, uh, makes basically the morphology of these objects uh, very similar to the, uh, to the morphology with this uh, of, of milli lensing that we expect in milli lensing, so with these uh, two compact uh, components. Um, then here on the right, you have the uh, multi-frequency VLBA image of the uh, only uh, morphologically confirmed supermassive binary black hole. And, um, and this is interesting because uh, uh, if, uh, if we, uh, we follow the uh, hierarchical merging theory and, uh, and, and plus the fact that uh, uh, galaxies, all galaxies should have a, a supermassive, or most of the galaxies should have a supermassive black holes at their center, then we would expect to see many more of them. So in both cases, we are talking about uh, very interesting uh, and poorly understood uh, sources that, uh, that deserve to be investigated. So as I mentioned before, we have uh, for our uh, 40 uh, millilens candidates, uh, we have uh, uh, obtained uh, new, we have obtained EVN time uh, to observe them uh, at 5 and 22 gigahertz in phase referencing for a total of 140 hours that were split into five observing sessions. Um, the analysis is still ongoing, so I will just present you some of uh, uh, of the some result on some uh, on some sources, so um, this source J of five twenty seven plus seventeen forty three, uh, still in our uh, new EVN five gigahertz observation shows this uh, uh, double compact uh, uh, feature morphology, 
uh, it still passes the uh, brightness uh, preservation criterion. Uh, uh, however, we were able with our new image to discard the third uh, compact feature that you, you see at the uh, uh, Astrogeo Epoch in a C band as a possible artifact. And um, if we measure so the, uh, the flux uh, ratio uh, between components uh, at the two closest frequency, uh, we see some discrepancies. So this is already uh, a hint on the fact that uh, this source is most probably not a, a millilens candidate, but we will also have the 22 gigahertz to confirm that. Then another source is uh, this source here, so J0237 plus 1116. Uh, this source in the new image, um, EVN 5 gigahertz, uh, is not showing anymore this uh, secondary compact component that instead it was showing in uh, AstroGeo data, and that uh, made us uh, uh, selecting this source as a possible uh, millilens candidate. Uh, it is instead of showing a, a more typical core jet like morphology. Also, we cannot discard the fact that we cannot resolve the, the, the component. But in any case, if uh, we have a model, the, uh, the, the emission of this source, and, uh, and uh, if, even if the uh, secondary component is there, uh, it wouldn't pass the surface brightness uh, preservation criterion. Um, the, this, uh, moreover, this uh, core jet uh, scenario is also supported in this uh, case by the uh, astrometric position of the optical emission uh, as given by Gaia, uh, which is uh, closer to the core and not in between uh, the two compact components, as we would expect in case uh, of a, a millilens system. Um, the last interesting source is this one that is very interesting just because we, we detected the uh, observation both at five and 22 gigahertz in color uh, from both compact feature. Um, just, uh, I just want to tell you about the source that uh, uh, even if we will dis finally discard with further analysis uh, uh, this source as a millilens candidate, this source is uh, still very interesting to be investigated because uh, uh, it was classified uh, by previous studies uh, as uh, both CSO candidate and also supermassive binary black hole candidate. So as um, anticipated at the beginning, this uh, uh, that I presented to you, uh, to you so far uh, was the pilot study for a more extended uh, project that uh, uh, has recently got uh, uh, funding from the uh, from the uh, from Europe. Um, this uh, project, uh, in this project, we, uh, we plan to apply the same uh, type of search for millilens uh, uh, system, but using a complete sample of uh, almost 5,000 radio loud uh, sources and using VLBI observation. And this time uh, we will take care of data from scratch. So it means uh, from the calibration step of, uh, of VLBI, uh, VLBI data, and the radio astronomer uh, know how uh, the, the, the load of work that, uh, uh, that is behind on this project. The, the idea behind this, uh, the SMILE project uh, comes from uh, two pioneering studies. Uh, Press and Gunn, first in 1973, developed the idea that the number of gravitational lensing events by supermassive compact objects directly probe the, uh, the uh, mass density, therefore the abundance of supermassive compact objects in the universe. Then later on, Wilkinson et al. in 2001 used this idea to uh, constrain the abundance of supermassive compact objects uh, with masses between 10 to the 6 and 10 to the, 9, 10 to the 8 solar masses uh, using a sample of uh, 300 sources and VLBI observation. And this uh, that you have here is the constraint that they obtain with uh, uh, no millilens uh, detected. With the, uh, with the SMILE project, uh, we will instead constrain the uh, abundance of supermassive compact objects with masses between 10 to the 6 and 10 to the 9 solar masses uh, with more than uh, uh, an order of magnitude better precision than in Wilkinson et al. 2001. Um, 
what you have in this plot is um, uh, the density of the universe uh, locked up in uh, um, object of a certain mass versus that mass. Uh, and as you can see, the, the constraint that we will obtain with the SMILE project uh, is below the lambda CDM prediction, while this was not the case in Wilkinson et al. 2001, just because of the size of the sample. And so the, um, the, since the goal of this project is uh, to estimate the abundance of supermassive compact objects in the universe with roughly 16 times better precision than in previous studies, then we need a sample that, uh, that is roughly 16 times uh, uh, larger than the one in previous studies. And so uh, for that, we, we used the original class catalog, uh, being class the most successful to date search for gravitational lens system on galactic scales uh, using radio frequencies. We used the class original catalog uh, and we selected those sources with a, a total flux density at 80 gigahertz higher than 50 millijanski. And we ended up with a sample of almost uh, 5,000 sources. Here you have the characteristics of the uh, sources in the, in the class catalog. And this is the, the distribution of the sources in the, in the SMILE sample. Uh, then, since we want to have uh, VLBI data for this, uh, uh, for all these sources, uh, we uh, cross match the the smile smile sample with the NRAO archive, and we found that uh, uh, there are already data for roughly seventy five percent of the sources in the in the smile sample, uh, and then for the remaining twenty five percent of the sources, uh, with we ask and obtain. Uh, time with the, with the VLBA uh, using the new uh, C-band receiver that allow, allows for uh, observation at the same time at 4.3 and 7.6 gigahertz. So the, uh, as I said before, the direct observable of, uh, um, of a smile uh, will be the abundance of supermassive compact objects in the universe. But since we are interested in a particular type of, com of supermassive compact object, uh, which are the dark matter halos at subgalactic scales, uh, then we need to, to know what is the expected number of these uh, dark matter halos uh, um, coming out from the, from the SMILE project. And this number is uh, uh, it depends on the both the density profile of dark matter halos as well as uh, on the uh, on their mass function, uh, which in turn they they depend on the uh, dark matter uh, particle properties. Uh, plus, these also depend on uh, on the experiment, uh, mostly on the sample size, and um, and uh, Smile will have the largest sample ever for this type of search. So then in order to infer this, um, this number, uh, so to, to constrain the number of uh, dark matter subgalactic halos that we expect to have in, uh, uh, with our SMILE project, uh, we computed the optical depth for each one of the source in our sample, where the optical depth is the probability for a source of being gravitationally lensed by another uh, source in between, so in between the source and, and us. And this obviously, this optical depth depends on the, on the redshift of the source. Uh, so we need then the, the redshift of, uh, of the sources, of all the sources in, uh, in our sample. And uh, we have uh, uh, redshift inf information for roughly two thirds of, uh, of our sources. And for the remaining one third, we consider a similar uh, redshift distribution. Then this optical depth uh, depends on the number density that is uh, um, the uh, that in turn depends on the uh, density profile and the uh, mass function of dark matter halos. Uh, as I said before, so then this is the parameter that is different for different dark matter models. And then it depends also on the uh, lensing cross section that in turn depends on the on the mass of the lens and on the uh, redshift of the lens and of the source. And then finally, it depends on the lens path that in turn depends on the cosmology used and on the redshift of the source. So we have computed then the optical depth for 
for each one of the source in our sample, and then basically summing over them, we obtain the number of expected dark matter as a subgradic scale that we can detect through millilensing. And this is what we obtain. So the, uh, the number of uh, dark matter uh, subgalactic halos that we expect uh, in, in our SMILE sample, if the warm dark matter model is the correct one, is zero. But this is because of the cutoff that I, uh, that I show you at the, at the very beginning of the presentation. Then we computed also this number for uh, three cold dark matter models, which have very different uh, uh, density profiles. Two of them have uh, uh, density profiles that come from, uh, um, from theoretical prediction uh, and, and body simulation. And uh, in one of them, instead, the density profile is uh, derived from uh, observation of, uh, of galaxy cluster. And as you can see here, we have uh, quite a, a different number for the, for the different uh, cold dark matter model with different density profiles. And, and this immediately tells us that, uh, that the SMILE will allow us to robustly discard some dark matter models depending on the, on the outcome of the, of the search. And, uh, and why this was not possible before? as I anticipated before, just because of the size of the sample. Uh, in, in fact, if we, uh, since the, the both uh, uh, sample in Wilkinson et al. and in our uh, SMILE project have a, a similar redshift distribution, we can basically use this formula you find here uh, to relate the, um, the expected number in uh, uh, Wilkinson et al. In, uh, in comparison with the number that we got in SMILE. And, uh, and so using this formula here at the bottom, we get that basically for uh, all this model, uh, this expected number is a zero in, uh, for the study in Wilkinson et al. 2001, which means that uh, just because of the sample size, uh, the, the study in Wilkinson et al. 2001 was not able to uh, discern between uh, different dark matter models. And so now uh, I think I'm quite in time. Uh, so just let me uh, use one minute to, uh, to advertise uh, the opening uh, the soon of, uh, uh, of two postdoctoral research and two PhD student uh, uh, position here at the Institute of Astrophysics uh, fourth in Crete. Um, so the candidates are expected to uh, to work mostly on the data calibration at the beginning of uh, uh, very long baseline interferometric data and uh, to possibly try to automatize this process. So also good skills in uh, programming are, are kind of required. Um, for more information, you can visit this uh, to uh, link I, I leave you here. And um, so if you are interested in this project, if you consider it excited uh, as I do, then uh, come, to, come to join us in this project. So thanks, I think I can stop here. Uh, thanks a lot, Carolina. And uh, yeah, let me just repeat that Carolina, if, if it wasn't clear that Carolina is hiring, so please uh, consider applying or spreading the, the, the word. Uh, so, okay, so any questions for Carolina? I can uh, I can start, uh, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, at some point you mentioned about these time differences between the the, uh, the lenses that uh, you you expect them to be, so that the time delays in the two images you expect them to be of the order of you know, sub a few hours maybe. Yes. Uh, below. So I was wondering if has anyone looked into. Uh, detecting this uh, um, uh, supermassive um, dark ma compact objects with uh, fast radio bursts. Um, Has it, anyone like done any sort of calculation to for the expected rates or anything like that? Yeah, for expected masses also. Um, I don't know actually. I don't, 
I don't know. I know about uh, about GRB studies, but uh, fast radio burst. Um, I don't know. <laughs> okay, maybe that's uh, something to look in. Uh, yeah. To look into because then then you get like super super high precision. You get millisecond precision. Uh, if you detect two, two, just, but anyways, that's maybe we can take this offline. Yeah, yeah, as a, yeah, the, it, it, it is interesting indeed. I mean, uh, working this in the time, do, time domain uh, gravitational lensing as uh, for the GRB, uh, the, the, the only problem there is uh, as users that is uh, you are using a kind of an indirect method so it's uh, it's kind of uh, difficult to be sure that the the two bursts as are, are the same just uh, uh, associated to a gravitational lens a lensing event and not instead uh, something really uh, coming from the source itself mm -hmm. indeed yes yeah. uh, so Vincent uh, please go ahead Hi, thank you. Hi, Vincent. Thank you for your very interesting and uh, very interesting talk and, and full of explanation. I actually had a, a question regarding this uh, time delay. Uh, you mentioned that because it is below the day scale, uh, then it's not a concern for your observation. But that, that, that means that um, the, the time exposure, in a way, of, of your experiment is larger than a day, is it? Yeah, it's just uh, because of the radio observation are usually... Um, so they are average or they are average in things through time, is it? Yeah. Okay. Okay, good, thanks. <laughs> um, I still have another question or comment, but uh, I see that others do also, so maybe I can speak later. Uh, we do have time, so please go ahead, uh, Vincent. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> I had another point, another question. When when you mentioned this uh, criteria about this uh, conservation of the uh, mass, so, so the surface brightness. Um, so for for well, I think. <clears throat> Well, I don't know. It's a, it's a more question or a comment, but um, um, during my master thesis, we, we looked into gravitational lensing, and um, when we consider unresolved uh, uh, observation, uh, it is seen that uh, <clears throat> you have an increase of, of, uh, mag of well, the mag magnification is increased in one of the of, of the of the images just because you don't resolve it, right? So you have a, a point, let's say, that appear brighter. So assuming that your surface brightness is, is um, constant in the two images, means that you fully resolve them, I think. Maybe I'm wrong. But then if, if what I think is true, um, I, I, I have the question, um, my question is, uh, can we can, can we really um, suppose that the, the 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 images from VLBI are resolved? I mean, you were showing those figures where we we see the blobs of of the light, but we also see the um, the the point spread function, which is not very small as compared to it. Is it? So I... yeah, that, 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 yes. Yeah. Thanks for the question. That's a very good question, actually. It's. Um... Um, so indeed, I mean, to have um, a reliable um, surface brightness measurement, you need uh, to, to properly constrain the size. Uh, so you need uh, really to resolve uh, the structure. Otherwise, if it's not resolved, you cannot, uh, you cannot properly get it. Uh, but we're usually in, um, in, uh, in VLBI, uh, Imaging modeling, let's say, or in the analysis of LBI data, we don't um, we don't we don't work on the image plane, and uh, and and the same as applied for uh, for this study here. Uh, we usually model uh, visibilities, and uh, so what you usually see in the in the images there that you consider as a PSF, that is the beam, uh, 
or the clean beam um, is, is not exactly giving you the size uh, or the, the smallest size that you can measure uh, of, of a source uh, uh, that you can measure. Uh, modeling visibility you can uh, usually reach, okay, depends very much on the, uh, on the, um, yeah, on the signal to noise ratio of, of data. Uh, but let's say that uh, on average, people are considering something in between. Uh, you, you can have uh, reliable detect uh, structures that are like one fifth, if not one tenth of your beam. So you can go smaller to this. And this is what I used, not uh, the, I model the visibilities. So, so when, when you say that the 1.6 plus or minus 0.2 is, is not, uh, it, it's an evidence <laughs> that this is not a millilens uh, candidate for one of the nice um, object, you're pretty sure about this statement. <laughs> You, you, I mean, do you, do you, the, the flux ratio, the difference in flux ratio, you mean? Yeah, the difference in, in, in flux ratio is, is um, um, robust against a resolution of that or whatever. Yeah, theoretically, yes, they are resolved the component there, yeah. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, thanks, Vincent. So, Constantinos, go ahead. Hello, Carolina. Congratulations again for again uh, for the ERC and uh, for putting yet another smile in the institute. Uh, so I have a question because I, I don't really understand the lensing technique and I have actually two questions and one depends on the answer to the first. Um, so are you able to constrain directly the mass or the distance of the source that you have the red sheet, or is there an interplay that you may have contamination from local sources and you cannot discern it from uh, your cosmological origin uh, sources? The mass of the of the lens, the lens that is yes. the one that we are interested in. Yes, in principle, the, the lens modeling gives you this because they uh, both, as I said, both the, um, the position and the magnifications of the lens images depends on the uh, lens mass distribution. Um, the distance is uh, something that you, you should have to plug in in order to get the, uh, the modeling. So it's something that we, uh, we will try to get once we have a very good candidate uh, to try to infer the, the redshift uh, properly if, if we can see the source. Uh, otherwise, uh, people usually estimate or, or consider something that uh, something like that the lens is in half way uh, in between you and the source. Uh, and so you, there are yeah. this type of estimate. So, so I'm asking this because there is this uh, scenario that effectively depending on the on the type of observation you have if it's from camera vessel first or, or versus we discussed then you can go to lower stellar masses for the lens then you might also have some contribution from intermediate mass black holes and there are these scenarios that you form seeds of supermassive black holes in global clusters and then through galaxy mergers you uh, just seeing them in the uh, galaxy potential. So it might be possible that you, you're gonna have, if this scenario is viable, um, that you might have some lower mass candidates that are not coming from cosmological origin, not primordial ma uh, mass black holes, but they are coming from cluster evolution. Uh, do you think but that it, this it, is a possibility? It, it... In our, uh, we don't reach very low masses in our case. Uh, we, we are limited to, to something in 10 to the six, still a super massive, uh, so 10 to the six and 10 to the nine solar masses, mass condensate. I see, so they would have to already form a super massive. Yes, yes, we cannot go lower. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Constantinos. Um, are there any other questions for uh, Carolina? Actually, I do have a short one. Um, are there any good uh, binary black hole candidates in, in your sample? 
Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know, to be fair. <laughs> But I you will know. get, uh, but you will get uh, multiple epochs, right? For yes. uh, for some of the sources, so that that would be an, another like side uh, product, I guess. Yes, and uh, yeah, and multi multi frequency uh, from the already from for this uh, pilot study, for example. So it can uh, already with the multi frequency can already help us uh, in discarding milli lens candidate, and then uh, they will remain also as possible uh, supermassive. Binary black hole candidate. I mean, the, the, there is this one source that I show you that was the last one um, that uh, where we did that uh, emission at 5 and 22 gigahertz, so, so already interesting for that, um, that uh, was classified as a CSO and, and, and also super, min, uh, super massive uh, uh, binary black hole candidate. So I expected uh, some of them are still. Uh, candidate possible candidate excellent so uh, any last question no, three two one no so okay so thank thank you Carolina again Thanks. and uh, good luck with uh, finding uh, people for the project. I'm sure the project will be very super exciting and looking forward to the next uh, years to sync uh, the results. And thanks everyone for joining and see you next time. Bye. Bye.